to come into Google, I was working in machine learning, uh, running projects, uh, seeing firsthand some of the issues that people can run into. And now being at Google, I work with customers all the time. I see a variety of challenges. And I just wanted to share some of the issues I've seen with all of you, have a great discussion, and uh, go from there. So let's uh, start with the presentation. Uh, again, I want this to be interactive. We're going to go through a lot of information, but there should be time at the end to kind of uh, you know, discuss any uh, scenarios you've run into or any questions you might have. So let's get started. One moment. OK. Here we are. Um, and uh, Sergey, uh, don't be shy about interrupting me if there's any technical challenges. So our topic today, 10 things that can go wrong with ML projects. Um, so there, of course, are more than 10 things, but I wanted to pick uh, 10 that I have personally run into and I think that are critical. Also, we're not just going to talk about what can go wrong. We're going to look at some of the solutions, and those solutions could either be um, through you know best practices, or they could maybe the, in some cases there are uh, tools that can help you uh, with these issues. Okay, so the first one. Uh, so here's the landscape of the different issues. They kind of fall into a few buckets here. Uh, building the model. Uh, once you build a model, getting to the right level of accuracy. Uh, then we'll move on to issues of transparency and fairness. And finally, uh, putting the model into production with MLOps and some of the challenges you could see there. So let's start with building a model. So it all starts with solving the right problem. So here in the graphic, we see the you know expression that you know, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? So it, it's important that we really are solving the right problem with machine learning. There's so much hype out there. Uh, so we're seeing some organizations just completely change, and they're seeing incredible results out of machine learning. And in some cases, we see some organizations struggling where they're not quite seeing the value out of that investment. And I, I think that there are some uh, questions that you can ask yourself and the team uh, to wonder what what really is the goal here, right? The machine learning model that you're building is just a... Uh, way to get there, but making sure you're clear on that goal. Secondly, what level are you trying to reach? You know, often it's a little bit fuzzy of where do you stop? Where, where, what's good enough, right? And so knowing what your baseline is, which in some cases could mean, what kind of answers do you get without machine learning? And then once you add machine learning to the equation, how does it compare against that? These are some of the things to think about. Um, one video that I would recommend uh, I'm putting here is from Google DeepMind. It's about product management for AI. And this video um, is from a product manager in the DeepMind area that's a research group within Google. And um, it's really interesting to me because um, there's, you know, in, in research, right, um, you're a little less tied directly to your users and so uh, this talk gives us some really good tips for how to adjust and stay focused uh, as you're discovering uh, you know, what your goals are here on the project. So uh, I, I highlight a couple insights. Um, one is be crystal clear on the goal of your project, but be flexible on the tactics to get there. Don't get stuck on one particular type of model or framework. Um, just be ready to adjust. Uh, second, you know, similar, set some milestones for your project. Uh, I know that it's tempting to say, well, we're in a discovery phase or we really don't know much about uh, what to expect, so I'm not comfortable creating deadlines yet. Well, try to time box your project, create some milestones, but be flexible on those as well if you learn new information. And we'll talk a little bit later about prototyping and the value of that. The final thing is making sure your users are central to each stage of the project. You are not losing sight of them. They're involved. You're showing them what you're doing as you go. You're continuing to interview them uh, to help be the North Star to ensure that you are solving the problem correctly, having maximum impact. So great video. Recommend watching that one. Oh, let's keep moving. 
another thing to think about is, um, is your problem a good fit for machine learning, right? Machine learning, um, you know, can do a lot of things very well. Uh, but again, we have to be careful of it, the hype where you just, uh, sometimes the management team might think you just apply machine learning and everything changes. Uh, so here are a few classes of problems. This is not, of course, the whole set of things it can do, but here's a few common buckets, right? One is predictive analytics. And this is where we look at historical data and we predict what might happen next. Uh, and that could be a couple examples here say fraud detection, where you're looking at a history of, uh, you know, different amounts, locations, uh, et cetera. And it, it might be a supervised learning problem where you're trying to predict whether a uh, future uh, transaction is fraudulent or not. Another could be predictive maintenance, where we're looking at um, metrics on a, from a sensor like heat and vibration and things like that, and trying to see if we can predict if some equipment is going to go bad before it actually goes bad. Um, the whole set of problems around that. Another is unstructured data. So maybe you want to cluster information to better uh, focus on what you need to triage, right? So we can look at videos, pictures, emails, et cetera. Uh, automation is another key use case, right? Where can we take a tedious or error prone step of a process and use machine learning to uh, you know, basically solve the problem and handle it automatically for us. Uh, and finally, personalization. Maybe there's a way that you can understand your user a little bit better and uh, help provide uh, more helpful information in your application for them. Okay, so that's about solving the right problem. Let's move on to the next problem, which is jumping into development without a prototype. And I think this goes hand in hand with solving the right problem is that we don't know all the answers at the beginning of the machine learning project. So think of it as an iterative, agile uh, process. Uh, start with something simple and continue to refine that. And also consider having a prototype to just say, we're going to create a short time boxed exercise where we're going to try to solve it um, you know, within a period of weeks. And then we're going to learn a lot along the way. We're going to learn about maybe some requirements that, that we didn't know existed. Maybe we're missing data that's necessary, or we've got dirty data. Uh, maybe we learn about how to scope the project, what's the complexity, the timing a little bit better. And that will allow you to uh, have more certainty as far as the rest of the project. So consider having a prototype phase there. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. I'm gonna, again, mention some Google uh, Cloud technologies, but um, really the, some of these ideas are universal. So um, if you've ever happened to use BigQuery before, a data warehouse where you can uh, take all of your analytics data uh, into it as a starting point, uh, it's got some really interesting capabilities where you can, if you're comfortable with SQL to write, you know, select statements, you'll be able to very easily create all kinds of models uh, you know, from deep neural nets to uh, even uh, does some time series, uh, ARIMA models, things like that, uh, all within BigQuery. So you can get some fast uh, prototypes uh, in the same place that you were uh, storing your data. Another option could be AutoML, uh, where uh, you're able to build a model without having to actually write that model code. You just bring your own data, and then those kind of middle steps that you see here in this diagram, training, deploying, and serving the model are handled by AutoML. It's going to search across a broad variety of uh, frameworks, hyperparameter tuning, uh, ensembling to find uh, a great model for you and then host it for you. So that can, again, help. Um, and it's not limited to the prototyping phase, but it's a great way to check your work, get a baseline, and then see if you might be able to exceed that. Okay, problem number three, model training can take a long time. And I'm sure this is a common one where, uh, you know, you have to wait a day or hours um, and that just really slows down innovation. You know, it, 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 wouldn't it be nice if, you know, like when you're coding things, sometimes you can just save and quickly compile, deploy your web application, see the result. Okay, there's a problem. Let me change something, redeploy, see the result. Uh, when you have to wait hours, you might get, you might switch to a different topic, get distracted, 
and it really just slows down everything. So um, if there's a way that you can potentially speed up that training time, uh, it can really help you try more ideas out um, and move faster. One solution to that is um, you know, distributed training. So for instance, with the AI platform uh, training service, you can submit a training job and not worry about the infrastructure. You can use TensorFlow or you know, XGBoost, a variety of different models, uh, provide your own Docker container and it will uh, help with that. And then take advantage of some of the uh, specialized hardware, uh, you know, so you can use uh, GPUs, for instance, to finish your job faster. Uh, another cool thing that it has is hyperparameter tuning. So you can provide a YAML file that says, here are the parameters that I want you to do a search. Uh, you know, let's put different ranges of learning rates or other parameters, and it will handle that for you and show you the accuracy for those just different combinations in the web console. Another option could be uh, trying out uh, TPUs uh, to run uh, very large uh, training jobs. Uh, you know, they are becoming a lot more uh, accessible with uh, TensorFlow 2.1 and then 2.3 recently. Um, really, it's just a, a couple more lines of code. There's a, a TensorFlow uh, TPU strategy that you would use, just like if you're running like the mirror strategy or some of the others, you kind of, you know, wrap uh, some of the model compilation code in that. And that's, and you might also point from your notebook to the IP address of the TPU and it's gonna run on the TPU. So it's uh, again, become uh, quite uh, straightforward to use now. You can really speed up those training jobs. Okay, let's talk about model accuracy next. <clears throat> So this is probably a common one if you're doing classification. Uh, you have an imbalanced data set. The samples that you have, uh, the number in one class or the other um, aren't are way off, right? I mentioned fraud detection before. So this is a typical example of that where most transactions are benign. There's no issues with them. And then a very small amount are fraudulent. And so often what models are doing are optimizing for the accuracy across the whole data set, right? So um, if you think about it, if you just, if your model was as simple as just saying every transaction is benign, you're going to get, in this case, if 99% of transactions are benign, you'll get 99% accuracy, but that doesn't mean your model does anything. So you really wanna look carefully at um, how is your model doing across every class and how do you handle the cases where you have much less data to work with in some of your classes. So um, I just wanted to point out here a tutorial uh, from TensorFlow that uh, has some great uh, you know, example code of how to handle that. I mentioned some solutions here to consider. So sometimes you can weight each class. Uh, so you can uh, basically provide uh, more of a uh, penalty for errors uh, on one particular class to help with that. Another issue uh, way to handle this is oversampling and undersampling. So uh, you could potentially um, maybe have twice the number of samples uh, in your, you know, basically double or triple the uh, number of samples in your minority class uh, to kind of bump up that number and help with the weighting. Another uh, option is undersampling, where you might actually reduce uh, some of the examples from the class that has more in it. Um, undersampling, I'm, I personally haven't seen giving great results. Uh, oversampling may have some benefit, well, you know, you'd have to see. Um, another option is generating synthetic data so that there are some packages that can actually, one's called SMOT, S-M-O-T-E, uh, for instance, uh, and it can look at the structure of your data and kind of the distribution and create some new synthetic data that might help to kind of help balance it. Uh, again, I've had mixed results with that, but it's, you know, and that might just be, I didn't quite get the right parameters set. These are all different things you could try to help with imbalanced data. Of course, getting more of the uh, minority class is always a good thing uh, to help solve that at the root, but if you can't, uh, here are some ways to help with that. I wanted to mention in AutoML, there are some things that you can do that can help with this issue. So when you train with AutoML, you 
basically have a couple steps. It's pretty straightforward. You import your data, you select what is what column are you uh, targeting, and then it trains your model. As you see here in the screenshot, there's also an advanced options tab. If you open that, you'll see that there's an optimization objective you can set. And this is where you, depending on your objectives, you could adjust this optimization objective, right? So you can see that, uh, say, log loss might just kind of uh, optimize across the whole data set, but you also can maximize the area into the curve uh, using you know, the rock curve or a precision recall curve. Um, and each kind of has uh, different, uh, you know, different results. So you can kind of play with that and see what kind of results you're getting across your different classes. Um, so here's here's kind of an idea too. Once you build a model, this is what you might see uh, in the case of a classification problem. Um, we'll kind of walk through one, two, and three here. So uh, there is a threshold, right? So as you're distinguishing between the classes, you can set um, what that threshold is. So you can play with that slider to try different uh, thresholds, getting different uh, precision recall metrics. Another thing you can do is uh, look at your confusion matrix. So here in this example, we're predicting whether a flight is going to be on time or being delayed. And we have a very similar issue here because most flights are on time and we can predict those pretty well. It looks like 97% uh, of the time we are. Um, it's trickier with the delayed flights. We just have much fewer instances of that, right? So we can look at this confusion matrix and kind of see how that you know it's playing out across all of our different classes. So you know after you go through this process, you could also update that optimization objective, build a different model, and see how these metrics uh, play out. Okay, all right. So let's run into another issue here where you know you've tried AutoML or you've built your own models, and you really just get stuck you know you say well this just model isn't very accurate it's not meeting our business objectives what can i do uh, so let's look at some some things we can do um, so you look at this graphic on the left here um, and this is when i was looking at that problem of predicting uh late flights right and so the data set that i started with just had the flight um you know, the flight times and um, the airports, just a couple pieces of information. So that was helpful. I got some degree of accuracy. But then what I did was I actually looked at this paper that looked at all the different root causes, uh, because I'm not an expert in this domain. I kind of did my own research on it. And I said, okay, well, weather, right? That's a very um, straightforward thing. Uh, and so I augmented my data set with BigQuery public data sets. There's a weather data set. And I could basically match and look at the airport code and then get some lat long from that, match that to weather stations, and then, you know, be able to tell, is there um, snow, rain, hail, et cetera, add that to the data set for a little bit more signal. And then you could see some of the other factors where you might say, okay, well, again, my model is doing better but I wish it could be doing you know, even better. Uh, so you can see some of the other factors that may not be in your data set that you'll wanna work with other stakeholders or somehow figure out how can I get this extra data so that all the root causes I have included as features. Um, so now if we kind of go to the right side, I'll just kind of walk through some of these uh, issues. So what I talked about just now is really about domain expertise, you know, math, and different, uh, you know, hyperparameters can only do so much. You know, really knowing the problem, having experts that understand the problem that might think creatively about how you're attacking it is super important. So consider pulling some domain experts in if you don't have that expertise. Second thing, you know, include more data, more, you know, of course, more of the same data always helps, but also some varied data, uh, training data. Uh, maybe uh, you know different features uh, and and kind of some diversity there in your data. Feature engineering, right? With the features that you already have, is there a way to unlock a little bit more signal out of them with some transformations that you can apply to the raw data? Another thing to think about is 
that you might have some extra features that aren't really useful that you're overfitting on. Your model is basically locking in on some features that don't that aren't really relevant in out of sample data. And so consider trying removing some of those. Um, and alternatively, back to this idea of starting with a simpler model, maybe start from scratch again where you have a simpler model, add back in features, and just, just see if you can remove, sometimes less is more. Of course, we can try different model architectures. Uh, you know, okay, well, you're using LSTN, maybe we try CNN, we try, you know, different hyperparameter tuning, some ensembles. Uh, and finally, I mentioned AutoML before. It doesn't hurt to try AutoML to just see, are you in the right ballpark with how AutoML is doing? Okay, so I hope that helps. Uh, let's move on to the area of transparency and fairness, a, a critical area. Um, so, you know, it's important that your model uh, serves all of your users well, right? So thinking about these issues from the very beginning, uh, and let's just kind of walk through a little bit of some of the questions to ask yourself um, about your model that, that you know, may be implicit, but as you think about them, I think it will, will help uh, your thought process, right? Around what problem are we solving? Who's the user? Um, what are some of the risks of the model? Um, and then how are you collecting the training data, right? So, you know, many times we make mistakes by um, neglecting to include uh, information, right? So what is your process uh, to collect the data um, and, and so on and so forth? This is a good way to kind of look at um, the whole process of building your model and uh, uh, looking at it responsibly look at limitations of it, uh, and then after you built the model, um, continue to evaluate and monitor it now that you have some real world usage. Where is it failing? Uh, where is it not performing as well? And that's a lot, that, those are a lot of questions to think about. So, you know, we're continuing to provide more and more tools. There's a lot more that can be done, but I just wanna point out a couple examples that might help you. Uh, one is the what if tool. And um, this is a really cool tool. If you haven't tried this out, you can include this in your notebook. And it uh, basically has this graphical interface that will show up. Uh, you can use uh, TensorFlow models, AI platform uh, hosted models that we uh, discussed before. And what this can do for you uh, as a lot of capabilities, one is uh, same classification. You'd be able to see um, all sort of uh, the, the data points here. And you can look at changing some of the values and say, okay, what if I change this value from 10 to 11? Where does it move in the chart? Does it switch it from one class to the next? So it allows you to almost to sort of debug your, uh, you know, your, your model and see how little changes matter. There's also something called uh, counterfactual uh, analysis where you find, um, for a given data point, what is the closest data point that ended up in the other class? So kind of, and then you're able to sort of compare, well, what were the differences, even though that these were determined to be um, by, you know, Euclidean distance or uh, some metric like that, um, theirs were very close, but what differentiated them? So this allows you to really dive in and understand your model better, the what if tool. Another option that you may want to look at, uh, this is called TensorFlow Model Analysis. It's part of TensorFlow Extended, a set of uh, capabilities that wrap around TensorFlow, uh, the TensorFlow Core uh, framework. So what TensorFlow Model Analysis can do is it can slice the data and give you accuracy by different features. So what we're looking at here is a view of this taxi cab data set. This is a data set where we are predicting if there's going to be a tip of 20% or not. And there's a lot of uh, features in this data set. You know, there's um, the duration of the trip, you know, starting location, ending location, et cetera. But what we're seeing here at the bottom is we picked one of the features start hour. And you can see, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, et cetera. What, what is the accuracy there? So we might be able to tell, okay, well, hmm, um, our model is not as accurate uh, at one in the morning. Um, maybe we have fewer training examples then 
Uh, maybe there's something we can look into our model. So it, it gives you, again, a little more granular view of what's happening in your model sliced by different features than by looking at just one number for the whole data set. Okay. So kind of related to that, um, it's helpful, you know, one issue is many models are this, uh, they're hard to understand, you know, especially as you have, uh, you're using neural networks, um, and there's this trade-off here, right, that simple models, uh, linear regressions are super easy to understand. You have coefficients for each feature in your model, but they're not accurate. So kind of you have this trade-off as you add more complexity, as you're trying to hit higher levels of accuracy, often you're adding more complexity to your model. So how do you explain how your model is doing? Um, so there continues to be new enhancements to explainable AI. So, um, you know, there are libraries out there that you may want to look at, uh, you know, Lime and Shap. And I wanted to also show some of the capabilities on Google Cloud for explainable AI, where, you know, we are doing some really interesting research that we've uh, made available to users around all different kinds of data types. So you see here, even on image data, trying to figure out uh, where in the image are the critical features, uh, you know, in text data, and then in tabular data, right, which is a common use case where we're coming back to the sort of the, here's a situation where you're looking at, uh, it's this rental bikes. So we're looking at based on distance um, and di different factors, how long is the trip going to take, right? So you're kind of seeing in descending order, the longer the trip is, uh, we're seeing, you know, what time of day, the temperature, these were all factors and kind of seeing in uh, increasing order of, or rather decreasing order of importance. Um, so that's explainable AI. Um, it is available in multiple services on Google Cloud today. So we'll kind of looking at all the different sort of layers uh, that are available to you. Let's just name it, focus on a couple. AutoML. So when you train an AutoML model, you will see feature importance for the model as a whole. Also, when you uh, send in a prediction, you'll see the most important features for that prediction. Likewise, with AI platform training prediction, when you create um, kind of a, a, a model that you're you're scaling to all of your users, you can turn on a mode where you're serving the expl explanations along with it. And uh, the deep learning VM, image, VM images and notebooks in JupyterLab now have the SDK built in for explainable AI. So it's even easier to uh, take a model that you're working on and uh, get some insights into it. One other new thing I wanted to point out as far as sharing how your model works, it's called model cards. Um, and a model card, think of it this way, it's documentation for your model. It provides a, a clear explanation of what does your model do? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What architecture did you use? What's the accuracy of your model? Uh, what data sets did you use to train and validate on? So it really gives your users a full picture of how to use your model and its limitations. Um, so this is this is um, something you find out more at modelcardswithgoogle.com. I also wanted to point out the model card toolkit. So I actually wrote a blog post on this recently. I want to point out it's Sure, it works with TensorFlow, but I my blog post actually talked about using with uh, Scikit-Learn uh, and basically how you can um, extract information from your model, use this model card toolkit with Python and end up with a generated HTML page that provides a nice documentation of your model. So this is something new uh, to check out, model card toolkit. Okay, so we've kind of talked about uh, this journey so far from building your model, explaining your model. And then as we all know, that there's a whole nother set of challenges around how do you um, make sure your model process is reproducible? How do you um, scale your model? So let's start to talk about some of the challenges in uh, sort of the intersection of DevOps and machine learning called MLOps. So, it's this is a real issue. You could accidentally push a bad model into production. So, if you're you know working very quickly, you're experimenting, you're trying out new models. What if you accidentally deployed a model that wasn't tested properly? Um, 
So consider something like a machine learning pipeline for this. Just like you with software code, you're going to have unit tests. You're going to have a system, you know, in Google Cloud, maybe like Cloud Build or using Jenkins. It's going to run your tests. It's going to perhaps, you know, automatically uh, deploy it, uh, et cetera. You could do the same with machine learning now. So here's an example with Cloud AI platform pipelines. You see on the right side, you create an end-to-end -end process that extracts data, maybe validates the data coming into your model, maybe the upstream systems feeding data, something changed and now your inputs are a little bit off. Um, you can also have an evaluation stage where you compare, is my new model better than my previous model? And then if so, push it to production. Um, and then you may wanna have some uh, artifact tracking along the way, right? So each step of the process tracking, okay, where where is the storage bucket with the input data? Uh, what, you know, what was the uh, distribution of, of uh, features like you see here in the screenshot? All of that, being able to track and save that each time. So that will help provide some guardrails around your ML process. Uh, because once your uh, model is being used into production, this is real. The, your model's making critical decisions that affect your users, and you want to have the same level of testing that uh, you would apply in any other software product to avoid bugs. Another problem that's a little less obvious is this idea of uh, drift, right? Where your model's doing great, then you know things slowly start to change, right? I mean, machine learning models often do hold for quite some time, depending on the domain. Some, some areas uh, are, you know, they can last a really long time. So think about like a um, text-to-speech, speech-to-text models, um, you know, may last a long time, but a model based on news or maybe a product catalog would change really quickly um, and everywhere in between. So the conditions that you learned from will change, and you're gonna see that accuracy drift down over time. So what can you do about that? So consider a couple MLOps processes. One might be continuous evaluation. And this is where what you can do is on the prediction side or the inference side, just occasionally take a sample of predictions coming through the model, then manually, compare to the ground truth, have some experts kind of take those samples, uh, assess the accuracy, and then, and then uh, you know, raise a flag if you're um, uh, above some threshold, right? So, um, so that's one thing you wanna do is to occasionally go and check those predictions, evaluate them. Uh, another thing you may wanna do, uh, this is more of a preventative measure, is continuous training. So assuming that you have those guardrails in place, the, the testing of your inputs, your model outputs, et cetera, you may wanna think about running uh, on a regular basis or when you have new data coming in to kind of prevent the data from going uh, down and becoming obsolete. Okay. And so speaking of model inference, the last uh, problem I wanted to mention is um, scaling model inference, right? So so we've got two very different workload profiles. Training is very spiky. I'm going to run this massive training job and then I'm done and I don't need to use the uh, service for a while. Inference is very different. I'm taking my model code, I'm putting it into a production application. And although it's you know pretty quick to run a prediction, your application could have millions of requests coming in. So how are you going to scale if your model uh, gets used all over the place? How are you gonna host it? How are you gonna serve all of those different requests? Um, you know, one option could be using the AI platform prediction service where you can uh, host your model and then it can uh, have auto scaling capability. So it will uh, add more nodes to serve your model and it can scale back down. It will handle the logging for you. You can also uh, take advantage of specialized chips uh, like uh, GPUs. Uh, it's built on top of Kubernetes, right? That's where the uh, scaling comes from. So uh, definitely a good option if you're looking to kind of 
handle that variable workload on the prediction side and um, you know have the logging and infrastructure uh, handled for you. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the uh, 10 problems. I just wanted to point out a few resources if you wanted to find out more. Uh, of course, the Cloud AI platform, uh, you know, is, this is the starting point for all the tools we talked about. Code Labs uh, at codelabs.developers.google.com. Uh, you can, you know, Google that to find that. Um, I should have probably put the URL in there, so apologies. Um, that uh, allows you to try out a lot of the technologies you heard about today. There's a machine learning section with a bunch of labs to try. Uh, finally, you know, we use YouTube quite a bit to discuss some of these concepts. Um, one of the channels that's popular is called AI Adventures, where we've got uh, over 50 YouTube videos talking about ML concepts as well as how to uh, use the platform. And that's it. Um, if you know, and we'll open it up for some questions and discussions. Uh, feel free uh, to you know add me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, to continue the discussion. So I will now stop and switch to discussion here. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing the talk. It was pretty pretty cool. And you did like quite a quite an overview, right? From like getting the data right, getting idea to almost like production and actually bringing to scale inference, right? So like really cool that you show it like all of those pieces. And while people are still kind of uh, getting their head around uh, the content and writing the questions, I will start with a couple of questions from my side. So you did mention um, how to ML, right? And it was like more in a section of, uh, I think you just like started with a simple model, right? And after your, one of the next slides, you were like, hey, and people can use how ML without, uh, you know, investing too much into the model itself, right? Uh, how do you see like from your experience, especially with like, maybe cloud users, right, or companies trying out them well, um, does it take it seriously enough, right? Or does it feel almost like it's like a magical one button solution, right? Because uh, I, I do remember at some point uh, I was uh, mentoring some startups and it was like a machine learning kickstart program. So like they should potentially have had a bit of like knowledge what they're doing with machine learning, right? But sometimes it's still a bit hard from, hey, we have business, right? Try to frame it like in machine learning perspective terms, right? And if you just give in like, hey, there's like up to almost like magical solution for your machine learning problems, right? Do they start thinking like more about how to frame problem or it's kind of becoming for them like too complicated and they like, okay, so it just like magically solves all my problems, right? So where is the problem, right? How do you feel? Yeah, it's a great question, I think. Um... You know, when AutoML started, I think there was this idea that uh, developers could just use AutoML and embed it into their applications, and that's it. You don't really need to know any data science. Um, now, I certainly think it has helped make it a ton easier and opened up ML to a whole bunch of more folks. I would still say, though, that um, it's really important to have some foundation in, you know, the, how to evaluate a model, right? Some of the concepts we talked about, like, um, looking at a confusion matrix, you know, then uh, things that I think are available in a lot of the the mm -hmm. courses that are out there today. Um, but I, I think it's opened it up. Um, and I do think for experienced data scientists, it's a great tool because, you know, uh, we're often so pressed for time that there's so many projects in, the, you know, this field, there's so many cool things we could do. Um, I find myself sometimes saying, all right, I don't have enough time to, you know, let me create a notebook from scratch and a new model from scratch. And let me, let me, let me try it out, see what I get. And often it's good enough. Um, it, it really is. Um, we've done some comparisons with uh, Kaggle and often it's, you know, maybe not, you know, been number one in the whole world uh, in Kaggle, mm -hmm. right? And keeping in mind that folks are working, you know, weeks or months in teams and their domain experts on it, but like giving this to a tool that has no, knowledge of the uh, problem, you know, isn't reading the instructions, looking for little tricks. It's getting like uh, amazing results on it uh, near the top of the leaderboard. So um, yeah, I think really it's, it's, it's not a toy. It can be used for production. Uh, we have examples where we're actually including it in a pipeline, right? So combining a couple thoughts here is, um, you know, um, yeah, it, it's, it can be used in production. It can be used in a pipeline. Um, we're actually working in Google Cloud of kind of integrating it even more. So it's not seen as a separate product like, oh, well, I'm doing my own, you know, hand uh, created models over here and I'm using a different product for AutoML. It's just, hey, um, where's your training data? How do you wanna 
uh, build your model? Do you want an automated version? Do you want to do it yourself, right? So um, yeah, I think it's becoming more mainstream and unified and I'm a big fan. Yeah, yeah I mean, definitely. I didn't mean that it's like just a tool or toy, right? Which yeah. is definitely like very helpful, right? And for, for me, it's kind of almost interesting that it feels like that, you know, there's like this joke that, you know, 80% of your machine learning like task, right, to bring something into production is actually about like learning the data, right? And after like, mm -hmm. you know, another 10% or 15% is about like building pipelines, right? And like there's like mm -hmm. 5% percent about this like exciting me building the models, right? And now we'd be like, okay, we're gonna optimize or like make it easier for those like 5% that everybody did enjoy quite a lot, right? But you still have to do all this like boring stuff of data cleaning, right? And understanding like all of this. So maybe at some point we need to have auto ML for cleaning data, right? Or auto clean. <laughs> Something yeah, like. no, I totally agree. Totally agree. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I wish it solved that that troublesome 80%. I, I, one thing that is cool, though, it does have some automated feature engineering. So like sometimes what I see folks doing is like, uh, say, for example, your model, um, there's might you might have a feature like is you have different results on a weekend versus a weekday, you know, you have different call volume or hours or whatever, it will do things like you pass in one column that's like a, a date timestamp, and it's going to generate a ton of features out of that, right? It'll look at hours, months, years, weekend, mm -hmm. you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, so it doesn't, you know, get rid of that 80%, but I'm hoping, you know, maybe it shrinks it a little bit. There's some of the, you know, basic stuff. Um, it, you know, of course, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, in a large enterprise, sometimes it's even... Uh, there's organizational issues, right? Where there are certain yeah. groups where they're holding the data and you need to work with your management to explain the value of the project and work to do the data integration. Can't solve that yet, but but certainly some of the, you know, more straightforward data transformations it will handle for you. Yeah, definitely. And meanwhile, we got a question from one of the users. Um, his name is, or her name is uh, Fun, and uh, asking, thank you for the talk, right? One question that, um, how would you handle ATL and GCP, data cleaning, feature engineering, um, et cetera? I guess there's like many answers, but maybe for more machine learning, like heavy um, pipelines, right? I mean, it also depends if it's structured data or not, but how would you do essentially ATL and GCP? kind of hard to answer, but if you can start. Yeah, I mean, I think you put it well. I mean, there are a lot of options and I don't want to overwhelm folks with the options. And I think that's an area that we can do a little better at explaining what tool is best for you. Um, we did talk today about TensorFlow model analysis part of TensorFlow Extended. So there is a um, TensorFlow transformation capability. That would be one way to do it where, um, you can, uh, you know, basically write some Python code. And, you know, there's um, under the hood, a lot of our products will actually use this technology called a Apache Beam. That's an open source tool to kind of run these jobs in, at scale. Um, so I'd look into ten TensorFlow Transform. Um, Dataflow is another tool on GCP that's very popular for high scale jobs, like large batches or streaming jobs. Um, great tool. Uh, one thing that's new that uh, I've used that's um, pretty cool is called Cloud Data Fusion. Um, I actually have a blog post on that if you Google it. It's a, it's a um, kind of graphical uh, tool where you can take um, little boxes, nodes, and drag them onto a diagram and say, here's my source data. You know, I'm getting it from BigQuery or a storage bucket. And let's do joins. Let's um, transform some columns. And then let's export to... Um, BigQuery or CSV or something like that. So that's a great way to get started. What's kind of cool about that is it will then run it on a Spark cluster for you. And again, you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. You click play and it will you know, set up the infrastructure. Um, one other th last thing I'll mention is sometimes you don't even need to do all that. Um, in BigQuery, you could do, you could create views. So you could take your raw data and then maybe create a view on that where you're doing some processing to it, your joins mm -hmm. across multiple tables. And so you have a view that's kind of the machine learning view on your raw data as well. And then you don't have to really go through all those data cleansing steps. So yeah. 
you know, makes sense. Lots of options, but sorry, <laughs> that was a yeah, bit yeah. long. No, it's, it's definitely, I completely agree, right? And uh, I mean, if, if you have um, fun, if you have like a more particular questions, you can always reach out to Carl on Twitter and we can take a look like what is like more particular for your use case, right? Because you're doing like structured data, right? It's like one type of like pipeline. Maybe you want to get it more regularly and you do some things that gets like hundreds of people data like every couple of days, right? It's going to be a completely different scale. But I agree that especially with Beam, it's something that makes it easier. It doesn't really matter how much data you have, right? Because it's going to spin up like nodes in the background and it's going to do processing for you. So definitely easier. Um, yeah, so another question is coming from, uh, I guess, Jonas. Uh, Jonas is saying uh, TF Lite is really great for deploying ML models for offline applications. How much development is done for TF Lite, especially is there an option for encryption, password protection of your models? And I think the idea being that, you know, your model, especially if it's like one device getting shipped almost like automatically and people may be afraid that if you're shipping it like somewhere, right, somebody can just like intercept and overtake your model altogether. Is there anything that you are aware of happening in this uh, direction or any research or it's kind of like uh, overthinking a bit? Yeah, great question. I, I just want to say I, I'm not an expert on the mobile meets ML side. This is a whole really cool area um, that some folks on our team, you know, they know uh, they use TF Lite all the time. For folks who haven't really heard much about TF Lite, uh, think of this as a way to uh, take your standard TensorFlow model and create a smaller one. It uses some capabilities like quantization um, and uh, other ways of sort of condensing the number of nodes in your model so that there's fewer parameters. And so it's really fast when you're doing, um, you know, uh, ML on the device, ML inference on the device. Um, and it has some other benefits like where, um, uh, anyway, I won't get into all those today, um, but super cool. It's worth checking out. I did want to also mention that uh, AutoML Vision, you know, we didn't get into that today too much. You can export a model as TF Lite and if you want to run it on your device. So there, we're doing more and more sort of integration between AutoML and, uh, you know, TF Lite. I don't know specifically about the password uh, protection uh, or encryption. I. I wouldn't be surprised if we had something like that. Um, one of the cool new things that I, um, again, I'm not, I don't know all the different TensorFlow libraries now. There are a lot of them. There's a ton of capability. One neat thing I was reading about recently was uh, TF privacy, which allows for um, basically some uh, minor uh, updates to, I believe it's um, kind of basically preventing with your training data, being able to know by passing predictions through it, whether a particular example was used to train your model. That's a little bit different than what you're looking at, but um, I'm not sure I'd look at TF Lite docs, but it's certainly a very active part of development uh, where you know, offline mobile use cases are huge in this field, um, but maybe in the future you can bring on a, have a mobile ML topic in this uh, series. Yeah, definitely. Um, and maybe another question, um, and it's actually an interesting one. What is the name of a solution you would use to serve plain, plain self-written Python models in custom-made dashboard or as an API? I guess like you mentioned that you have XGBoost, right? You have uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow models that can be hosted. Can somebody host something, I don't know, like more custom basically, right? Um, something that's not supported out of the box, or you just like adding like more packages and at some point there's gonna be like more inference available from GCP? Yeah, okay, so if I understand this question correctly, it's what if you're sort of creating something custom, you may not be using TensorFlow or scikit-learn. Mm -hmm. um, again, lots of options. I'll mention a couple to think about. Um, let's start on the lighter, I think, easier side. Um, Cloud Functions, if you haven't heard of that, is a neat thing on Google Cloud where you can basically say, here's a, cup, here's a couple lines of code just make it a function and serve it and give me an endpoint. And that's all it is. And then you have a lot of tracking around, you know, number of requests coming in, it scales really nicely for you. Um, GCF, Google Cloud Functions, uh, if there's a, you know, like sort of a code snippet that you wanna turn into a little microservice. Another option is uh, take that code and put it into a Docker container. And then you have uh, capabilities like Cloud Run that will host your model um, you'll expose a port uh, for the traffic. Um, that would probably be a little bit more robust uh, approach if you had, you know, a bit a bigger code base. I'd look into that. 
Pretty cool. Would actually just a short follow up on this one. Would Cloud Run support custom um, resource allocation? Let's say, can you run Cloud Run or GPU to get inference on GPU, or is kind of uh, a bit uh, too custom use case? Um, I I am not sure about that. Uh, but that actually reminds me that I believe uh, I mentioned the AI platform prediction service. It now has a pretty cool capability where you can run custom containers. Oh, nice. So I haven't done this myself but you may be able to um, take your code and sort of, um, you know, put that on that service. And then I believe it kind of, it's, you know, Cloud Run is a little more generic. That's kind of just for general runtime. It may serve your needs. There may be some interesting things that the prediction service can do for you if you use a custom container there. Yeah, awesome. Um, thank you for answering uh, all of the questions and uh, for doing this amazing talk on Thanksgiving. Thank you again for your service sure. to the community and uh, making machine learning community uh, as a better place. Um, yeah, with that, thank you again. <laughs> Great, Sergey. Thank you so much for hosting. Uh, everyone listening, thank you. Great questions. Uh, hope to be a part of the group again. Yeah, have a good. Great. Okay. Of the thank day. you. Bye. All right. Ciao. Cool, um, we done the first talk. Um, we got like really good overview and now we